before I talk about the humanitarian part, let me just say once a uh, couple of words about uh, recovery. And I had the opportunity to be in the London conference in, in June, which was an excellent opportunity. Um, and many of us put gender on the table. And I just wanted to share with you that one of the Ukrainian colleagues, and I will not identify that person, said to me at one point, but why are we talking about gender and recovery? If we build a bridge, if we build a road, uh, men and women use it. Everybody uses it. Everybody has equal access. And that showed me, and it was such an important comment, that actually that's not what we're talking about, is it? We're talking about something much, much more substantive than that. But that comment also showed me that together, and that's why I'm really pleased we have today, but I hope we have many more opportunities, together actually there needs to be a broader dialogue and a deeper dialogue um, in Ukrainian society because I think all of us women everywhere around the world since time began have proven ourselves and let's, let's keep fighting together for, for, for our space. So when I thought about this gender and recovery, like what are the most important components? One is look at your gender wage gap and your gender pension gap, which are there. And why do I raise it? Because when we you know, began this mammoth humanitarian response, which dear Irina knows is the largest the UN has ever overseen since the beginning of the UN, women needed more assistance than men because the starting point was not the same. IT, and I know about the dream system, I was in the meeting this morning with Vice Prime Minister Kubrakov on recovery and all the embassies. Ukraine is so advanced, sometimes I feel absolutely ridiculous because you're much more advanced than I am or my own country, which I won't say which country that is. Um, but women only represent 24% of, of employees in the IT sector. And we know this sector is growing fast. You just said it yourself. This week I was in Izum. We're using drones to identify agricultural land that is contaminated or not contaminated. Women need to be part of that, but at 24%, you're not very, very well represented. Small and medium businesses, 33% owned by women. So again, another place to grow. But as recovery happens, how are the businesses owned by these women connected to this work? How are we going to ensure together that these companies actually can compete, one, amongst companies owned by men, and two, amongst the bigger companies? Very, very practical questions. And we also need to consider, and, and I think the other panelists have said it, not just the hardware, but the software. Gender-based violence, it exists everywhere in the world, whether it's domestic violence, violence against elderly people, sexual violence, conflict-related sexual violence. It's an issue everywhere in the world. But in a context of a war, with this unbearable trauma and stress every single day, of course, gender-based violence continues and probably is growing. So if we're not investing, and you don't need anybody's help in terms of responding to the survivors, supporting the survivors, or preventing it. But the resources required to do that are absolutely essential. And if you don't do that, then survivors don't have a voice in the recovery. Now, on the humanitarian side, again, this is, it's so big, sometimes it feels overwhelming. And when I arrived last August, there was huge pressure on the UN and the NGOs to assist in the delivery. But we know that communities and neighbors were the first people to respond. That's absolutely clear to everybody. And within that, women were playing a key role. I was in another country and I was watching on the television the women cooking, the women going to people, the women caring for people. This is what we, this is what we do. So when I came last August, you would have thought that I would immediately go and talk to these women, and I didn't. And I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Why didn't I do that? because I was under pressure to go fast. Also from member states, because it was about delivering assistance. And I thought, okay, if I bring in too many people and I go and talk to too many people, I'm not actually going, going, going. And I, I, I think you feel that pressure in Ukraine. 
think you feel that pressure. People want to come home, don't they? Either those who were displaced or those who had to leave the country. Again, in Izum this week, so many people have come back since it was liberated last September. So they need to have a place to live. They need to have the hospital. They need to have critical social infrastructure and they need the demining to take place. Does dialogue slow us down? Well, now I'm having to catch up. And as many people in this room know, I've been meeting with women's civil society. Um, I've been meeting with civil society representing people with disabilities and the Roma community. So it's just my personal you know, thought is that if I had slowed down a little bit at the beginning, um, I would have really developed those relationships. And why are those relationships important? Because we need to be providing the assistance when people need it, and we need to be providing it in the way they need us to provide it, particularly on the front line, which is very complicated, those deliveries. I'm providing them what they need, not what I have. And I really got told off in Kromatosk a couple months ago by women's civil society saying, you're giving me this and this, but I need that. Why am I not getting what I need? Don't you have the resources? Oh, yes, we do. So again, slowing down, inclusive process, but also please to civil society, it also is, you, you're a little bit siloed as well. And I think you, you need to look at how you can come together. And so I'm pleased to see today in the room, people I know from those different, those different groups. And I think the issue of silos came up very clearly at the London conference, from, at least from my perspective. I participated in a number of events, and I did a round table um, with government on recovery. And then I ran from there across town to the gender and recovery meeting to do the closing remarks. And my closing remark was, how come I have to be in two different meetings on recovery? I didn't think about that. I think none of us who organized those events were thinking about that. So time to think about this. Now, what am I gonna do differently on the humanitarian side? And I've had some very clear recommendations from the wonderful people that I've been meeting who've been helping me to understand better the specific challenges. The international humanitarian system has, has groupings. We call them clusters, they're like sectors. Um, these organizations are invited to participate in these, in these groups, one. Two, doing better to connect them to the humanitarian funding, because we have a lot of influence. And I manage a humanitarian fund in this country, which is significant. So rather than giving the majority of that funding to international actors, actually the last allocation, which was $70 million, the majority is going to national actors. But that requires a clear decision and pathway to, to doing that. So those are just a couple of things I've been doing. And I'll just finish again with recovery. This morning we discussed a lot about capacity strengthening at the local level, because the plans will come from the communities on the recovery, right, as, as you were saying. So the member states a lot this morning were talking about capacity strengthening, okay. Make sure you do that capacity strengthening and make sure you have a gender component. So the international community has an important role to play in this and we need to hold ourselves um, accountable to this as well. Next week I'll be going to Sumi where I'm co-chairing with the governor of Sumi. Uh, I'm meeting with civil society, international actors, uh, private sector so he can explain to all of them his vision for the recovery of his region and the heads of the Hamadis will be present. Excellent, excellent opportunity to have gender again put on the table. And I think going towards the Berlin conference next summer, it's the one that follows London, what are the things we need to do together to ensure that gender is really integrated so we don't have separate events that civil society is more prominent in these discussions. I spoke more than civil society in London. I'm not sure that's such a good thing. Thank you so much.